where to start, I can start by talking a little bit about uh, the exhibition, uh, exhibition next door and the uh, purpose of the diorama and the acute uh, angles at which you view uh, the blue cabin that at this stage isn't blue but still has Al Neal playing Thelonious Monk inside. Um, it more or less you know, represents, of course, a, a, a romantic vision, but it also represents uh, the fact that it contains everyone that's ever uh, occupied it. And, um, and now, at this stage, uh, how we've uh, uh, re-envisioned it, and at the same time tried to uh, retain as much of the past um, as possible. So those little spy holes you see when you're looking, looking through there, um, that, that vision is constricted, and that, in a way, also represents how you know, all of our ideas about uh, the past are very much our own, and, and we fill in the details. Um, I just had an email from a friend who said, how's that restoration going on Malcolm Lowry's cottage? <laughs> and I, I wrote back right away and I said, it's, it's, it's done. <laughs> it's really great, because I thought that person should you know, enjoy the fact that all those manuscripts never burned, and, and the, second, the second cottage as well was still there. So, so I, I uh, yeah, I let it be. Anyway, um, the blue cabin. Um, all, uh, the, the other thing about the diorama too is the fact that it's neither uh, uh, dusk nor dawn. It's somewhere in between, just like where it was. It occupied this space between land and water, and it was. It's fluid as an idea in so many ways, which in turn translates into this great idea of being an artist residency, because things come out of that, where there's this uh, idea of, of being able to move in any direction. Um, so I've often looked at um, the Blue Cabin when we were working on it at wee hours or late hours, and uh, admired the form and the half light. It's a very it's a different world. We, we remember things in full daylight quite often. Um, and it's, 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 um, it's interesting to give it context by giving it a time of day or besides the year it was built. But the year it was built, up, as far as we know, is 1927. And there was lots of four homes built. This is Coal Harbor. You can see there's a there's one with a little curved roof about the same size as the cabin. It looks very similar, um, but not quite. Like the, the cabin is, is is extraordinary by comparison. But but a lot of people existed. You know, they would work in log camps, or they would you know be fishers, or they that that was that same sort of. Uh, liminal existence on water, Coal Harbor, False Creek, all those areas. Again, you see more of the curved roofs happening there, right? Um, early days Vancouver. There's some Norwegians. They're all Norwegians. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. And our friend that built a cabin could well be in there. We were told that he was a Norwegian. The, man, the Mackenzie shipyard, uh, where the blue cabin ended up, told Al, Al, the guy that built this was Norwegian. So that's what we're going with. Uh, and that is a picnic of Norwegians in Central Park in Burnaby in 1930. So he could be in that crowd somehow. And it's up to us to imagine he did. And he, you know, he was there. And, and, and there's some of the men. And, and when we imagine somebody like that, when I imagine somebody like that, I imagine a hero. So it's this guy. Right? <laughs> there he is. There's the guy who built the blue cap. I don't think he would have made any blueprints at all. I made blueprints. Blueprints aren't made anymore, but they rely on a process uh, uh, that's basically the same as what was known as a cyanotype one of the earliest forms of photography, actually. But I thought, since we were taking it apart, then um, 
there should be a way to put it back together and also note how it was put together in a way that's responsive to the era it came from. And, and he must have sat down and he must have thought, um, I tror, jeg skal lave en lille trehus, uh, cirka 30 kvadratmeter, which is him thinking in Norwegian, which is what all people would do if they're new, new immigrants. He also may have been first generation Canadian and thought of it in English, but he would have thought of it if he were an immigrant in metric terms, so square meters versus square feet. That was Danish, by the way, not Norwegian. <laughs> <laughs> the way we know it was a Northern European uh, who built it was this type of framework, which is called many different things depending on what part of Northern Europe you come from. If you're in Denmark, it's called Binningswerk. If you read the word, it's Bindingswerk. It's, if it's uh, German, it's Fachwerk, and it's the same, it's framework. Um, Berndt and Hiller, uh, Hiller Becker did a terrific uh, photo series in 1967 of German framework houses where the frame is, is exposed on the outside of the building like Tudor houses and you know, like uh, other houses in, in North, Northern uh, Europe um, going back to you know, the 1400s moving into the early 20th century. So this is the real thing. That earlier thing was my drawing of it. That's, that's it exposed from the inside. Um, on the outside, what we did was we, we followed the engineer's report, which was you have, to, you have to put some kind of shear value on the outside of the building or it will fall down. What he did, which was really clever, was by putting in this diagonal framing, he could just nail the siding on it. He didn't have to put any sheathing on it. But when we, when we took it apart, we added this, and it is so strong, let me tell you, it can fall off that cribbing and it'll stay square. It's, it's good for another hundred years, but you don't see any of the plywood. This is the model that Seuss built of the cabin that also shows the framework. She built it virtually the same way he built it, but one inch to the foot. And that's the model you see in the diorama next door. That's another drawing that illustrates that crazy network of framework um, that I'm sure he knitted <coughs> together as he needed to without any plans. Oh, skip one there. There it is with the outside off. Um, without anything exposed, we don't imagine what's on the inside. And what this cabin is made out of, um, this, is, this is Douglas fir. That's a, that's a two by four piece of wood. Uh, and it's got 45 years in it. This is Tsitse. Tsitse is, is uh, Hulkamelum language for what was later called Douglas fir. And that piece of Douglas fir was in a tree that was alive before it was called Douglas fir. And that's the material that blue cabinets made. So the trees that were alive, that were later milled, to make the blue cabin were around in the 18th century in the mid to late 1700s. Um, and they stood in the forest and thing, you know, actions happened around them. Um, it's, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, situation because now that we have, you know, so low a percentage of original growth wood like this, um, we're uh, now chewing through the remains uh, at an alarming rate and binning it versus uh, saving it. Once it's gone, it's, I mean, the second, this is, you know, things that have already been known are now being lost. But there you go. Um, that illustrates the materiality of, of uh, the, the wood.
the framework was, was pretty much slapdash. He just, he put it together, um, and, and when things didn't fit, he'd do something like that, just put a chalk in there, just a little block to make up the space so it wouldn't slip. He knew what he was doing. But, you know, once the outside was nailed on, well, you know, it was going to be strong enough. Uh, there's a big wad of newspaper up there, and there was a newspaper throughout this whole place. I, I you know, I, we, we both, Seuss and I, wondered what was going on, <laughs> because he, uh, he, he applied so uh, many decorative elements to this building that you sort of had to wonder what was, you know, was it just, you know, obsessiveness in terms of loving that process or was there a, 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 another motive? What was it? He originally painted it this color. These are his colors, green and white, same as all of the BC forestry buildings that were across the province at that time, they were all painted green and white, and this green you could buy off the shelf. Um, you can't really buy standard colors off the shelf, they're all mixed now at an extra charge. Um, but um, the windows are really amazing. They're very, very, they're, they're applied like a, um, a stage set. They, they are separate, they're, they're on a two by two frame and they're nailed to the side of the building. It's very odd. You see that? It also helped protect them so there was air behind them so they, did, they didn't rock. It was lower down, it was a bit more of a problem. And all this, all this, look at that. Every single board had a uh, piece of molding nailed over the crack on the inside of the ceiling. So there's like a couple hundred pieces of molding there. What was all that for? And I think that, you know, initially he may have painted it white, but very early on it became these, these bright sort of rudimentary colors, the, the, the red, yellow, blue, green of the period. And fitting, this is a compound curve, fitting two pieces of molding together. That's what we had to do to when we had to make the replacements, we had to cut each one of the ends like that, just the way he did. He choreographed the whole thing for us. And looking in that window at night at the kitchen, I, I wondered whether or not he was making a nest for somebody, whether or not he was wanting, you know, uh, his girlfriend to come over from, from Norway. But that's, a, that's that kitchen. And Al said to Carol, we better take care of that kitchen. That kitchen is very special. Um, and he was right, it's extraordinary. It replicates that arch, that same curve on the roof. All he did was he made every straight line curve. Uh, all he did. He did it obsessively, right? Um, but really, in a wonder, that's a letter from 1927 to send to somebody in Norway that, he, that if he did that, he might have included a picture like this with the framework on the barge in Pearl Harbor, which probably might, it might have been the reason she never came. <laughs> <laughs> but the other theory that Seuss thought about was uh, that he was involved in theater, because if you look at this, this is like sort of bunting, you know? It has a, a kind of a, authority of a stage in a way when you entered the parlor you felt as if you weren't meeting somebody that in fact you were being presented to somebody in a way there was that strange relocation uh, when at least the feeling I got when I, I stood in there and that's what we found under the floor um, you're probably aware of that story that we they, he, he went up to Philip Tim's printers and got a bunch of uh, uh, old posters and blanks. All, that, all those pieces of paper on the, the wall are just posters that were never printed. That's the same paper. Um, all these people appeared in, in Vancouver in 1927, which is then why we think it was built in 1927, which is risky, because you're saying, well, you know, 
you trust it was in but that's what we're going with there's Susan in his band just like the Rolling Stones but not <laughs> <laughs> and that's for a film a silent film and and this guy this guy here he TKO'd that guy <laughs> And that's sort of the, I mean, it, again, you know, it's, it's the end of maybe one era. He, he, uh, he moved over with the cabin to the North Shore in 1932 to work at the shipyard, as far as we know. It's the same year they built the oil refinery on the other side that Malcolm Lowry wrote about in Under the Volcano. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to say how long he stayed after he moved there, but this is, this is, it was electrified after he moved there. And we can tell that because this molding is taken out. This wire is nailed over top of where the molding was. And it's kind of um, imposed. So we figured it was electrified once it got over to the shipyard. And there's, you know, the requisite switch. And this, this is a, this is a light fixture from the Springwater Lodge on Main Island. <laughs> but it's exactly the same uh, light that was hanging inside the kitchen in the blue cabin. It's exactly the same type. Ironically, a Benjamin fixture. Not the same as Walter Benjamin, but it <laughs> um, so, uh, so there's a bit of Main Island in, in the blue cabin. But uh, quite primitive wiring and quite you know, sensible and minimal. Um, and as soon as he or whoever it was uh, was over there, they started getting newspapers. And I'll tell you, it didn't stop until that cabin was moved. There was paper going in and being stuck in the walls and in the holes and everywhere any kind of cold air could come in. This is, I, I changed when, when, when I figured the Norwegian moved out, I, my, in my mind I thought the Union guy moved in because there was a Union newspaper stuck in a slot in, in, in one area. But this was another piece of paper that we found. It's, it's, uh, it's this piece of paper. It's the same, same uh, uh, page from, from 1938, showing the, cir the circus and, the, and, and, and marijuana, the assassin of youth, playing in the plaza. Um, and, and when you see those things, when you see scraps of paper, when you see, you know, bits and pieces of detritus that are the byproducts of change that we see going on all around us, it's really, really difficult to read. It's very difficult as a language to look at something and say, well, you know, that identify it, to, to absolutely know that that's something that speaks from a specific time, has a specific purpose, or in fact contains as much as this contains. If it's, if it's uh, that, what is that? That's something that passes by that you just will never, ever notice. But if you know it's that, all of a sudden, you know, there's something to look at and something to read and something to understand about a particular point uh, in the historical landscape um, where we don't invent. And what we don't know, to me, is, is enormously interesting because we do invent, because we must. There's paper everywhere. There's, he took this, someone took this, stuffed it up to, to fill a place where cold air was coming in. Well, it's filled with information, too, as are these. As, that's, that's the ceiling. Because of that. Because in 37, 38, it got cold, I guess. It wasn't insulated. Right. 
we took the part the hardware from the from the door that was in the keyhole. <laughs> <laughs> that's how cold he was. Remember, he was. That's how cold he was. And that was the letter slot before we restored it. And that's the thing. That's the that's the the union paper that was wadded up and put in that slot. And that slot was nailed shut. And there it is. It's the labor statesman. Uh, interestingly, the word labor is written in the American way rather than the English way, but yet it's the labor statesman for Vancouver, 1937. And another era ends. <coughs> this is PG, and this is LG, and they are a man and wife and family that moved into the cabin into 318 square feet of what that cabin is. Four rooms. This is the water closet, bedroom, parlor, kitchen. With kids. And it's 1950, and they need a shower. But the Norwegians built the uh, Windows too close to the corner, so no problem. Just build the shower through, through the window. Uh, it's okay. You can get a shower in there. And he poured concrete in the base, and they took showers. They plumbed it. They had iron pipes running through the bottom of it. I don't know how long that lasted into Al's time, um, but I imagine at first it was probably still working. Um, it was quite something pulling up that concrete. It reminded me of a, a Rachel Whitewood sculpture because it had all this perfect casting of the floorboards underneath it. That's where this dark paint is here. That was the shower. We left that. Of course we did. There's one of their newspapers they stuffed in the wall. <laughs> For John. For John. 1950. Um, I don't know. What was the Danish gym team doing in town? <laughs> <laughs> but John won a trophy for a bicycle race. And what would you know, you know, uh, by looking at that? Is John winning a bicycle race? No, you know. I mean, it's a wonderful shape. It's a wonderful color. And there's someone staring at you. But it is a really abstract thing based purely on materiality. It's really lovely to look at, but, but you have to imagine what it means, which is so much a part of what the blue cabin is. Uh, we freshly varnished, that's why it looks so shiny. It doesn't quite look that shiny anymore, thankfully. Uh, but these, uh, these three windows, this trim is uh, is the result of the 1950 family. And we replicated this trim on those two windows because it came out of them wanting to put in this. Uh, first he came in, he wanted he put the put the shower in. And then he thought, oh, well, why don't we have a door leading to the outside? And then he changed his mind. Uh, and then he put all the boards back. And you can still see all the short boards on the outside of the building there. And he thought, well, once I have it out, I'm going to put in a bathroom cabinet instead on the inside. And that's what he did. And that's the cabinet. Uh, we, we put in this because it just had the two by fours leading. It was a little, you know. So we put in some half to it. And there it is. And it's a really interesting, unusual kind of a treatment for a frame too. It, it, it's, uh, I don't, it's quirky and, and interesting. Um, and, and they deserve to be remembered as well. And so why wouldn't one? Uh, and, and that was painted into the inside of it. And, and it's still there too. It's still there. The razor blades are there. And why not? You know, what, what harm can it possibly do? It's like industrial amber, you know. It's... Now that cabin, and when he did that work, all that wood, it was um, put through 
the Ebron sawmills and the and drying the Ebron sawmill kiln, which uh, Seuss and I salvaged when they when they demolished that sawmill. And one of the things we found, of course, was the blueprints for the for the uh, kiln. So we, had, by some coincidence, have that. And this, who knows, right? Things happen like that. There's some jewelry that we found. Genuine jewelry. <laughs> Blue and yellow earrings. And pearls. And when I found those pearls, classic pearls, the first thing I thought of was n not the string of pearls, but the string of pearls breaking and the memory of the sound of the pearls hitting the wood floor. I should say something about this line here. That's a really shallow uh, bell curve that's just absolutely amazing and difficult to build. And again, makes you wonder what um, that Norwegian was up to, putting so much effort into this cabin to be shifted to a shipyard, to be lived in, to work at the shipyard. There's 70 pieces of decorative element on the outside on the outside. And that beautiful bell curve. Which wasn't obvious uh, because it had a second fascia nailed over it to just, just made this raw curve, this raw arc. Um, but still compound. So it's still a compound curve. It's coming out and it's going up at the same time. And the way they did they made it was they just took a a saw and made a whole bunch of little cuts on the underside and then bent it up that way and it made just the best place for mold and rot to just get really <laughs> set in there. So it had to it had to come off and um, we took it off and we discovered this nice one. It says 60s. And and Al came in 66. And we do know that. That's true. And that's where Al chopped the firewood inside the cabin. <laughs> At least the kindling, as far as we know. And he worked it right down to this area here, which basically is into the subfloor. <laughs> and that's when the cabin, when we first went in, it was covered up. And there's this funny piece of wood sticking out, plywood, because they put plywood on the floor to help sustain it, to help you know protect it and make it go a little longer. And so what's this? So we pull it off, and it's this. And it's a moment when the cabin didn't burn down. Oh, it went through nearly the entire floor, but not quite. There was tar paper, layers of tar paper. It consumed all those things, but it didn't burn down, because they were lucky. And uh, those kind of things happen all the time, too. And sometimes we know about them, and sometimes we don't. That's to keep the mice out. Al's idea. I, I'm not sure it worked. <laughs> <laughs> but both of them are um, in the diorama next door. And paper. Al put paper in these pipe holes. Everybody who lived in that cabin stuffed it full of paper. There's a piece of Al's stuff. There's just it, and it's this wonderful sculptural form that, yeah, it's, it's an amazing evocative thing because it contains all of this and yet you'll never read it. It's, it's a very, um, it's a compelling uh, object. And the beer house. <laughs> and the tape recording of my home on the Fraser from 1948 that displaced uh, White Christmas is the most popular song in British, British Columbia that year. Um, I bought a reel to reel to listen to it. And the coins. Michael Turner tells me he lost one of these. It's a 1967 nickel. Did you find my 1967 nickel? He says, and I said, I'm sorry, we didn't. But we'll keep our eye out. And this piece of music this handwritten piece of music 
And when I saw this, I thought, L. And then I looked at the top, and it said, trumpet. And then I thought, probably not Al. Probably Al's got the piano for that piece. And it was a rumba. But it's a lovely object. Again, it's, it's hieroglyphic. It's, it's this, this language that is utterly visual, but something that you have to imagine. And looking through the front door, when we took that door apart, it was already, all the joints were, were wide from slipping and slipping. And, and, and Carol said that Al showed her the way to get in and out of the cabin by kicking the lower corner of the door to help move it along. And the difference, they'd shaped it off. And, the, and because it was like uh, on an arc, because the supports were uneven and it was high in the middle, um, when you opened the door, there was an inch and a quarter difference from one end of the door to the other, and the door was only like three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when I took that door apart and re-glued the whole thing, um, I found that the glass was too big. And that means that that glass was broken at one point when the door was still together and not set. So I had to cut eighth of an inch off one edge and put it in. But, but you know, little clues all the way along tell you that different events happen, and different, um, you know, what is it if some window breaks? Why does it break? What's the circumstance? What does it mean? Why is it important? Maybe it isn't, maybe it is. Who knows? But. There's ways of discovering all these little things, and um, there's also an opportunity to consider them uh, within whatever context you're living through. That's the color that uh, the cabin was painted in 1989, when Jim Jardine took that wonderful photograph of Al sitting in front of the cabin in his beach chair. We painted it the same color, but that's not how it arrived. So later on, we painted over it, which in turn is another replication of you know, what went on before painting over, changing the color. We painted it this color. This is how it arrived when it came to make wood farms where we worked on it. We never visited the original site. We've never been there. And we don't want to go because we've been told all about the original site, and we don't want to change that by going to see what the site is now. It's better to, you know, imagine. 22 steps, blue to green, top to bottom or bottom to top, I'm not sure which end they started on. Carol painted out the record. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting what that red does in shadow. You think, well, that red is going to make that cabin stand out. You'll see it every time. They were thinking, well, we don't want it to stand out, actually. We want it to be a bit protected. We would like to have some privacy. Um, but nevertheless, Al thought it was a great idea to have Mackenzie barge orange and the reds and the various colors applied to the outside and first somehow it was like putting a blanket on it wasn't it Glenn, it, it seemed like it was a, this invisible kind of veil that was put on it that saved it from the harbor board who got so terribly embarrassed that they missed it later and ordered demolition and they went through winters there. They said, Al and Carol said they were warmer in that cabin than they were in Strathcona. And I can see why, because that stove was like, well, it wasn't huge, but it's only 318 square feet. And you start that thing, and I can imagine the windows and doors were open just to keep it cool, because it takes so much oxygen to burn wood that way, and it heats so much that, you know, you, it becomes stifling. But, uh, the weather and the evening and the animals, the ants, the 
eight, um, well, let's say tunnel. Uh, carpenter ants don't eat wood. They, they, they cut holes in it as their colony grows, and it drove out nuts. Uh, because going through hard fur like that, it telescopes the sound. It's like a loudspeaker until that particular uh, rafter, one day, he just took a saw and just cut it right out. And um, it didn't stop them. But that was what I found. It was on either side of the, the rafter. The way to stop carpenter ants is to make sure that they don't get moisture. And they'll just go away. They need moisture. So there's a little leak, a little tiny leak in the leaf cover, just enough to keep them happy. And the mice, the mice that would, you know, brick allures, collage artists. <laughs> they had everything in that nest. There were more than one nest, and there was more than one cheese grill on the inside. <laughs> Paper wasps, different sorts. Mud wasps, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of mud daughters, which are basically fairly innocent insects. They don't sting you, and they, they, they take care of other insects that you may not like as much. Um, and then it was us. And then we were fixing it. And there it is with the roof torn off, which was the first thing uh, we suggested that we would do in our uh, proposal was that we would take the roof off and then we take a look at uh, the floors and we go from there because you need to keep it dry as quickly as possible and we were fearful of North Vancouver rain and that summer when we started in June a year ago almost it precisely it was just the most beautiful weather the whole summer long there was hardly any rain at all and when we took the roof off the color inside just excited it absolutely became rapturous. It was amazing because all of a sudden this natural light was pouring in from above and uh, it was electric because the eaves and the windows are quite close to the eaves so you get light in there but not so much natural light that is. This is again with the roof gone. I mean look it's you want to ascribe a particular architectural era to it. You would like to say that it might be Art Deco. It's not Art Deco. It's the Norwegian, and it's his thing, and he invented it. It's like Outsider a little bit. It's, it's quite extraordinary. I mean, its obsessiveness, and its uniqueness, and its replication of the art, and the fact that he noticed that and, and did all that. And this is a ghost of the the blue cabin because we took that paint off because it was the only way to replace it and we replaced the, th the three lower boards all the way around because they were rotted out as were the ends of the floor joists and uh, sistered the floor joists added, added a new one beside it the windows we, we cleaned and rebuilt and this is Seuss's notes working to within an eighth of an inch, as we did with pretty much everything there. Someone chooses a color like that. It's incredibly personal. And so what we have is an archive of color in something, too. Like that. And the green, and the green, and the green. That green, you could buy that green off the shelf. You'd have to ask somebody to mix it and bring in a sample. You know? And the yellow. Where the pipes were, instead of putting in paper this time, we put wood plugs in. So we took, we salvaged some of the, the wood that's the first growth, and we made plugs and carefully put them in. In the kitchen. In the kitchen. If this had, if this had white around it, it would be half of an Icelandic flag. If it were red and blue, it would be a Norwegian flag. <laughs> There's those three windows again with the 1950 family trim on them. And these are the ghosts of walls. These flat boards that we put perpendicular to the floor represent where the walls existed for the water closet, the bedroom, and the parlor. There was only a fragment of one wall left. Alan Carroll had opened it up, which was sensible. 
so they can breathe in there and form their own archive and fill it up as much as possible and work in there and be inspired, um, rather than being separated in little rooms as they did in early architecture. The corner, a corner near the door, and these, the window hooks, they're all the original window hooks, and there's so many of them. But these are window stays, and these window stays came from a hardware store in Athens, because that's where we live for part of the year, and they have the best hardware stores in Athens. <laughs> and you need to put that on the window because it's sitting out on the water, and you open the window, the wind's going to take it and smack it, and tear the hinges out, and who knows why. The glass. This was the glass in this window when it arrived at the farm. And this is the glass we put in it. This glass is uh, about 100 years old, and, which is older than the cabin. But the rest of what was extant in the cabin was also that wonderful rippled glass that when you think about it, again, kind of makes you wonder what was seen through those windows at various points in its history and the fact that it was in Coal Harbor at one point and North Vancouver another and in turn in the future somewhere else again on the barge. Uh, tin can patch over hole and I think that's uh, probably it may have been the Norwegian, I don't know, but that's a pretty early looking patch to me. So I thought, well, on the outside, why wouldn't I make one that's out of copper over knot hole that, that was there? And, and my patch looks worse and older than the patch that's older and better. And our replication of the uh, steps of color, which took a couple of tries on my part, that was difficult because the change is so gradual. But it's, it's actually quite a magnificent thing if you think about it. And just, you know, uh, going from <coughs> green to blue, as you say, uh, Glenn, uh, Carol, under Al's direction, easy to say, <laughs> not so easy to do. And there again is the 1989 version. The one thing we did do is when we repainted it, we kept the 1989 sill, which is red. But that's how it, more or less, how it arrived. Um, the other thing we noticed that some of uh, these arches on the bottom of the house had been replaced. Somebody else had fixed it earlier. And the way we noticed was that the Norwegian's cuts were straight. And whoever replaced it had a bit of a difficult time with the uh, saw. So when we replaced their replacement, we copied that wiggly line because we wanted to remember them too. It was an effort no matter what. <laughs> the other thing we did was we put fender washers behind these, which takes them out about an eighth of an inch off the siding so that there's air behind there so it won't rot again. Well, can you go back to one? I can go back one. Thank you. You're welcome. This this is what it sort of looks like, but doesn't. <laughs> this doesn't really look like this, and I don't know why. It doesn't look like this because this color, for some reason on a computer screen, in the best possible circumstances of a dark room, looks far more vibrant and far more blue to green. And in this circumstance, in fact, it looks a little bit more like it did when it arrived, which is sun bleached and somewhat faded. So although this is the new painting, for some digital reason, it looks like the old painting. <laughs> this is a windowsill we put in that got a corner knocked off of it, because there's a drip line that you cut under each sill so that when the rain comes down, it doesn't hydraulic backwards and go into the building and create rot again. Well, you know, when you cut that, there's a there's a risk that this can happen. And this broke off, and we thought, well, it'll still work. We'll just leave it there. And that's, you know, our contribution. <laughs> These are the two chimney flashing pieces. The original's machine-made, 
The replacement is handy. And spikes. And the flashing that now exists on the roof that's copper, like marine flash, you like marine architecture, like something that can exist near salt water and survive in weather like this. And it's great that it looks like that through snow, still incredibly colorful and alive. Al's floor. <laughs> and there's that sand, beach sand, right? From chopping, uh, chopping uh, wood from the beach. You know, when you put it up the chimney and it creates toxins, you cannot believe in terms of being bad for the environment, but keeps you warm. And then when it, you know, there's where it almost burned down and we're patching it, making it right. And the baseboard again, the baseboard was missing when it arrived and we looked at it, it had, had a baseboard and it had also had decorative elements before that went the other way. Like it, that Norwegian just did not leave that thing alone. As far as it was. It was just, and again, there's the floor. We numbered every single piece of wood we took out of there. We put a number on so we could place it exactly where it went back into minus what was ever was rotten. And then we have to find a replacement piece of wood to, to put in its stead. Uh, corners. This is made out of Al's bookshelves. It's actually the kitchen counter now. But it's first growth wood. And first growth wood, by the way, first growth edge grain fir costs you $25 a foot for a 1 by 12. At the same time, it's being crushed and binned. There's the, uh, the original electrical panel you can call it that, that we put back exactly where it was, cleaned up, ready to receive or not electricity, probably not, but it's an amazing industrial piece, a uh, piece of industrial design. And, and Carol's mat, she painted this blue mat when you came on the door. But not all of it was good near the sill, so what was cut back in this particular situation I left so the carpet got a little frayed, but it's all the same wood. And there it is, just about it, the finish of our escapade. And Al's pencil's still back in its place, actually. I don't know. You could write a note to him, probably. It needs sharpening. And all this, you'll see that next door. It's a, it's a diary. What we did for five months, for seven days a week. Um, but, you know, it's abstract. Uh, and despite reading it, it's the opposite now. You're not going to read the whole thing because it's too much. You just you have to imagine what was done at the end of the day. And that's it. Wow. Uh,
closely tracks the architectural profession. <laughs> no, I'm not making this up. There's an essay yeah, called yeah. the Asperger's Profession. Yeah. Uh, because Asperger's correlates very highly with spatial ability, high intelligence, and absolutely no social skills, which describes a lot of architects to T. And having taught them for 20 odd years, it is absolutely spot on in uh -huh. plenty of them. Uh -huh. so, I, I suspect your Norwegian is a prime example. Was an absolute yeah. obsessive compulsive, yeah. and they get obsessed with geometries and recursives and fractals and so on. So he's got all the markers. So it gets more interesting. I heard an early version of his talk a, a year ago, and it's, uh, he's ever more interesting. And I don't have a mental image of it. Okay, so that that's the informational one. Now the the more uh, kind of big picture uh, comment. There's an amazing alignment this summer in this town. I'll start with the weakest and the dullest of the three shows. That's the Cabin Show at the Vancouver Art Gallery, um, which is, you know, it, it's pretty and it's well made models, et cetera, but it, it's, a, it's an American thesis about Thoreau going to the woods with almost completely token Canadian content. Doesn't mention HBC or anything. So, anyway, but Cabins Galore at the Vancouver Art Gallery this summer. A big step up is Jermaine Cove's amazing show at the Richmond Art Gallery. And I really urge everybody in the room to go see it. Sorry, which art gallery? Uh, uh, Richmond Art Gallery. Just opened on the weekend. Yeah. She's both uh, taken all of her kind of architectural interior installation pieces, and they're all there, which are gallery architectural elements. They're not to be lived in, but they're art made for gallery setting that refers to inhabitation. And then she's also built a mobile tiny home parked outside the gallery. And it's a beautiful piece of craft itself. Mm -hmm. So the first show, the bag show, is art historical, architectural historical in the worst sense. Germain is a rare feature of a, of a builder slash fine artist doing a gallery practice that uses and refers to building, which leads up to this problem, which is uh, the most uh, uh, amazing of them all. Intellectually, I'm trying to kind of replace, uh, replace it and you. I think ultimately the urge here is curatorial. <coughs> You've done an amazing act of cur curatorship in finding this <coughs> and taking all that time to restore it. And it's, a it's also a cultural historian's epic quest. It took you know, not just to restore the object, which is what architects do, but you're really interested in what the papers say and all that. It just is absolutely amazing. So, um, I, I, pres I don't write much about art anymore, but I'm going to try to find a magazine that will give me 2,500 words <laughs> and pay me <laughs> to write a, a feature essay about all three shows. Now, any words to the I mean, am I out of alignment? Are you really just some builder guy who stumbled into this? Or? I don't think so, given your commentary. So, so uh, give us a bit of an auto critique. What, first of all, why'd you do it? Well, I guess it was an amazing opportunity. My interest in terms of uh, the practice as a visual artist is uh, the language of the archive and uh, the translation of the past in you know the least orthodox possibility, and uh, um, you know how that manifests it, and, and and what materiality, what sort of objects, what sort of subjects best represent that, uh, and I think that that's kind of innate in my in my uh, character. Uh, it has been for a really really long time. I haven't had a chance to ask Glenn or you that are you going to do a full catalog or is there a book in the making or is the archive going to go somewhere? I'm just very curious. The go stuff on, that was I mean, that? I mean, we're going to eventually put it on a on a platform with a, for a residency, but it, I mean, these kind of projects, I mean, this is kind of the, I mean, Jeremy and Seuss have been the first residences of Blue Cabin Project. <laughs> 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 You know, and so I expect there will be like many more catalogs as it goes on. And mm -hmm. kinds of. I mean, right now there's just up there. There's a a great article by in Subterranean and the and Jeremy's article in uh, in Catalan Review. So I mean, the writing on this has been amazing. There's a lot of people have been interested, including the newspaper.